every time I start a live stream, it it does something different. <laughs> God, so, I love it. Technology. I'm. I think it we're good. looks like we re now... really are live. Fantastic. Yep, we're live. Hello, everybody. Well, welcome to the Folk Music Educator Podcast. My name is Phil Kramer. And I'm Erin May Lewis, and I'm still trying to figure out what YouTube is doing right now, uh, <laughs> but I'm here, <laughs> and this is the Folk Music Educator Podcast. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. We've had a couple of weeks of just life. Um, life has happens when you're, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, and we were making <laughs> other plans, and life happened. So we are here, and we're so happy to be back. Yeah, definitely. And we we had our like, hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? And immediately we're talking music nerd stuff. So I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. Exactly. We were talking about, um, I have a student right now who's a uh, my only teenage student. They are 14, I think. And they do play in their school mariachi orchestra, which is fantastic. I think it's so cool. Um, but they took lessons with me to kind of do some fiddle stuff. And over to, as time has gone on, I've been trying to find a avenue for momentum. Usually, yeah. Sometimes kids really get into the technique of things. We can work on the technique. Sometimes they get really into learning fiddle tunes or ah, like improvising and so on and so forth well uh -huh. this student in particular has really found an interest in jazz and i was like okay so we've been working on learning some jazz inter beginning stuff we were learning um yeah when the saints go marching in and the little they're loving that yes one. yes uh-huh and so i was like you know what we should try to learn honeysuckle rose it's in the key of F. It has some chromaticism. It is an AABA -A form. So my brain is like, okay, this is kind of complicated looking at the, the sheet music. I know how to, like, I know this tune and everything, but I like to read uh -huh. off of a thing so I can make sure developing this in a good thing and have a cheat sheet for the student just in case. I was like, maybe we'll work through the first part of the A this week and then the second part of the A next week. Then we'll do the B section in one week, so on and so forth. They learned the whole thing in one fell swoop. And in the key of F, which I know is hard on the fiddle. Like that is not an intuitive key. It's not an intuitive key at very at first. Yeah, there's harder ones, but that's kind of one of the first ones that's like, hmm. <laughs> like, uh, right, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it is the tantrum inducing key that you might get from a, a fiddle player. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um and I was so proud of them. And we were chat. I was telling Aaron about this when we were first loading up. And we were talking about how sometimes our training in different parts of, because I think when you get to go to music school, for better yeah. or for worse, even the most progressive music schools in the country have at least the perspective and lens of what a typical classical music education system kind mm -hmm. of looks like there are classrooms mm -hmm. there are ensembles everything where you're either um mirroring that exactly or you're reflecting it back which is yeah. kind of the same thing but you know what i mean um but it was funny because like looking at the sheet music of this thing i was like this is way more complicated like da -da 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 -da. Like the syncopation, all these things. I'm like, how do I explain yeah. this to a student? And then I'm just like, okay, we have the first part. And then I tell them we repeat that three times. The first time we play the little da once. The second time we play it twice. And the third time we play it three times. And they immediately got it. They didn't need to understand the understanding of the syncopation or anything. Just what it looks like on paper, how to, yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so that kind of brings us to a question of like, at what point does, I we were kind of talking about, like you, you were mentioning um, 
oh, what's her name? Seeger. Uh, to tell oh, Ruth Crawford you're, Seeger. You're, yeah. yeah. You, were, you were kind of saying that. Well, yeah, because you were, you also kind of mentioned that you had a conversation with an ethnomusicology student recently, and we were talking about kind of the idea of like, um, I've never met an ethnomusicology student. I've just been really fascinated for a long time with ideas of like ethnomusicology and the sort of trying to trace and study and go deeper and, and figure out sources and how to do dots connect and all of that. And um, like Ruth, Crawf Ruth Crawford Seeger was really steeped in classical music first and then is now obviously a very important part of folk music and her child is Pete Seeger, who is really, really important in folk music, right? And also Peggy Seeger and also Mike Seeger, like these are the children of Ruth Crawford Seeger, um, all of whom have had important careers in folk music and um, done a, a lot, I think, to like bring folk music into mainstream, but also study roots and branches of folk music. And I, I sometimes wonder people like Ruth Crawford Seeger or the Lomaxes, John Lomax, and then later his son, Alan Lomax, like there's obviously some amount of them putting the filter of, of what they know, what their training, what their first experiences with music is over top of the music that they get then go research and study. Um, and how that changes the music yeah. <laughs> when once you at and so the thing about ethnomusicology is is i think the way i understand it is that you're sort of trying to get underneath of the thing but you're also putting a lens over it because you're putting the lens of your own experience over it in some way and so you're trying to simultaneously go under the story and figure out what are the roots and branches and how does this connect and what are the different sources and is there a version of it that is maybe the first version or is there uh if we write it down right now today the way we heard it how accurate is that as, of a representation of the way it is often or usually played i mean we you you and i both are in very improvisational music situations with bluegrass being a big important part of our formation which is really improvisational and sometimes when i'm talking to old time music people they're like oh no it's not we don't improvise we play it the way it was and i think i mean you play it the way it got recorded or written down once but who's to say that that is the only way that that person ever played it? You know, Tommy Gerald played it that way once. Does that mean that Tommy Gerald played it that way always? I am a skeptic of that yeah. because I am a person who started writing down my own arrangements of music when I was in high school. You know, I, I won the National Mountain Dulcimer Contest when I was 17. And I learned to write down how I played the arrangement. And now I'm 36 and I am pretty sure some of my arrangements, I still play the same way because I arranged it. I learned it. I performed it. I recorded it. It's mine. I play it the same way, right? And I go back to the transcriptions I did in high school and I go, I don't play it like that. And then I question, did I write it down incorrectly because I didn't have as deep of a knowledge of how to transcribe music accurately, or do I play it differently now than I did? And we'll, we'll never know. How do we know? But I just see the way music is always changing and I become skeptical of there being a way. I don't yeah. know. No, I think you're right because <laughs> there's a great quote. Um, I can't, I can't remember how to pronounce their name. N a a i s nin n i s nin. That's um, we don't see the world as it is, but as we are. And I think there's yeah. a little bit of that is that we have perspectives that we kind of approach new information in a back like a backlog of past experiences that we can kind of use to understand mm -hmm. 
that situation. And I think one thing in particular with chatting with a lot of meth of ethnomusicologists, not all of them, Gabby Cameron, I love you. You're very sweet. You're my friend. Uh, <laughs> but there are a lot of the time I talk to folks who walk in and they're like, Hey, I'm studying to be like, ethnomusicology of these spaces and there's almost kind of a false sense of expertise that kind of gets brought in mm -hmm. even though they haven't ever really participated in the culture as an active participant only as an observer i am not a part of this community but i've been studying it so obviously i'm an expert at it yeah and uh and i've and I realize when I chat with them that I go, you obviously are very literate in a lexicon of your own. Mm -hmm. I can see that you have a deep understanding with a lexicon that's not really shared with us. And right, right. And a lot of the time, I do. I think it probably goes both ways. I think um, I sh should be willing, like I should be willing, and am able to learn their lexicon, learn their systems and understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from. But I would also like that to be reciprocal in some ways and not just yeah. kind of shoehorned in. And you I know, it's interesting because I think my first experience of that that made me recognize it was when I was at South Plains College studying bluegrass music, performing in ensembles. But as part of the program, you had to also take classes in studio, like operating a studio and running recording equipment and yeah. also classes in live sound. And I was especially interested in live sound. So I took some extra classes in live sound. And one of the live sound classes involved an element of ear training, which surprised me. But the language for the ear training in the live sound class was in Hertz. Yeah. You had to be able to recognize a feedback pitch by its Hertz. <laughs> and at first I was like, this is so unnecessary. I'm never going to use this in my real life, right? Because I am, I'm probably my extent of setting up live sound is going to be for myself at a coffee house and like yeah. i'm just gonna turn the volume down if i get feedback i am not gonna be running a a show in a huge stadium where i am the sound person who has to recognize that feedback loop and kill that one particular frequency you know but what i started to realize is that if i could learn the the hertz of my strings on my instrument and I could learn a few of the kind of landmark points then when I was at a place that had a sound person I could say the frequencies around 1k hertz are really overwhelming the other frequencies you're making my dulcimer not sound like a dulcimer could you make an adjustment in these free this frequency range and then we could speak each other's language. And so it was one of those moments of realizing that we are in parallel fields, sound person and performing artist with a completely different vocabulary for the same idea, the pitch of a sound. Yeah. I would use note name vocabulary because all of my training has been in, in reading chord names and note names and standard notation and their buttons on their devices have hertz and so they are using a totally different lexicon of language to describe the same thing it's all over the place where we're speaking different languages to describe the same things and all of it is this sort of imperfect layering of language over the sound that is somehow compelling to us. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, it's very much like a Tower of Babel type of situation. Where we're <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and ugh, 
and I like. Part of me is really ener energized and excited by that, and but I um. I've been reading a book by a guy named Buckminster Fuller, which is such a great name. <laughs> yeah. A, an author, Buckminster Fuller. And he was this architect and philosopher and futurist and so on and so forth. And one of the things he talks about is that specialization, like hyper specialization on things can actually be, start to become a hindrance because of a lot of those things. We start to lack our comprehensive knowledge skill sets. Like us humans, we're really special in the sense that not only can we play, you know, music and do math and do all these things like AI can, but we can learn how to do all of those things in the same lifetime to certain degrees. It's, we're really malleable in that way. And that a lot of the time the specialization ends up it makes it more profitable to people because like, mm -hmm. oh, there's someone who's deep <clears throat> knowledge of this one mm -hmm. thing that mm -hmm. sometimes can limit our connections and our own mm -hmm. community building aspects and all that stuff mm -hmm. versus like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be spending my entire life focusing on becoming an expert in just this one singular thing, but have yeah. multiple comprehensive kind of things and i think that's one of the things that you know I my dad used to always call that the like colloquial language for that i think is the jack of all trades and master of none right is the yeah. person who's just got a well-rounded knowledge base of a lot of things mm -hmm. it's I funny because i feel like my whole life is this sort of paradox of like every single thing i learn related to music or culture or life or whatever i'm immediately like how does this relate to the mountain dulcimer so i have this sort of like <laughs> i want to only be super specialized in this one thing and also i'm pretty sure everything i learn ever can apply somehow to this one thing that i that i do so i'm like yes give me more information i don't know enough yet about all of these different like sub genres or all these different i don't know enough i don't know yet how this applies to mountain dulcimer but i, de I definitely need to learn more about this broader base of things so that i can figure out how mountain dulcimer is a part of that <laughs> and i think there's a <laughs> i think it's only natural to want to do that and i definitely have those aspects myself I just, I, I get really excited about the, like, I had a student recently, we were, after our lesson was done, and we had learned the tune by ear, um, after the tune is learned by ear, and I know the version that we've ended up kind of learning together. Yeah, had, right. They're current um, Oh, do you theory. notice when you're, this is like a, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting oh. you. Do you notice when you're teaching students by ear? that some phrases get turned a little differently than the way that you learned to play them. But in the end, it still fits perfectly. But if you had written it down the way you play it, it would be different than the way you ended oh, yeah. up teaching it. Oh yeah. Like it's, I don't have a pop can here, but like <clears throat> I, I make this analogy with students a lot is I will have like a can of Diet Coke, an empty can of Diet Coke here. And I go, what do you call this? And depending on what part of the world they're in, they will yeah. can a, a soda, a pop, uh -huh. so on and yeah. so forth. And those regional differences are important because you listen to Soldier's Joy played by people in Missouri, they play it differently. It even has a different chord structure. It's still the same mm -hmm. B part, but they, mm -hmm. the way they order the notes is going to be a little bit different. And so like when we look at Fiddler's Fake Book or something like that, yeah. The reason that no one is happy is because it is basically, oh, we're taking 40, 50 different versions of Soldier's Joy and making the closest approximation to all of them. <laughs> and so it isn't anyone's version. <laughs> it's no one's version. It's kind of interesting. Like, uh huh. No one particularly is all that happy, then we know we've done a good job. Mm -hmm. And. <laughs> 
So to mm-hmm. me, it's always felt more of like, hey, um, like one, if I'm teaching something for a student in the moment by ear, I can go, okay, fourth finger isn't really prepared to do that little phrase yet the way that I do it. What's another turn of phrase that will get that does it, something else that I've heard or something, and we could adjust it. And then I can make them kind of a bespoke sheet music of the thing in that moment. Do they ever just play it back differently? Yeah, there are times where they play something and go, ooh, I like that. We should keep it. Right, yeah, that's one of the things that I've started to notice. And, like, I – it's it's also interesting because I have always learned most quickly from reading. I'm a fast reader. Mm-hmm. And I've it like I have a natural aptitude, I guess, to reading. It's I learned it when I was young. It's always been easier for me to read than to learn by ear. Learning by ear has been this long, long, long struggle yeah. for me. Such a long journey. <laughs> um but I'm starting to teach some of my students more by ear and ear slash rote. But one of the things that is really interesting to me is that I'll watch a student struggle with a phrase and then just play something that fits but isn't what I played. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's for sure the way you should play that. Because it does. It fits their hands better. It fits their stylistic repertoire. It fits the way that they approach music. And I think that if I handed them the tab for that piece of music, they wouldn't have discovered that. And neither would I. (laughs) Like, we would not have discovered that there's a way that fits their playing better. Yeah. than the way that fits my playing. But because I didn't start with the paper with them and I did start with the ear and then they struggled with matching that f- exact phrase that they found the better pathway for themselves. It's so exciting and interesting to me to sort of begin observing that. And Oh, yeah. Like... The, the technique that I use for students is like if we're playing a phrase and we've hit a section that is particularly difficult and we just aren't seeming to get it, <clears throat> I tell them, okay, this is what I do when I approach these sections is I stop and I take stock of all of the notes. So I really make sure I know not only the, the notes the note names and the relationships to each other one three five seven so and mm-hmm. so forth mm-hmm. but also the rhythm of what's happening the one and mm-hmm. two, three four and kind of idea yep and once i have that i say i'm going to create three to five other ways of playing <laughs> that same phrase whether mm-hmm. if it's exactly note for note perfect to just in different positions whether I'm using mm-hmm. other embellishments such as slides or hammer-ons or pull-offs, but mm-hmm. I want to create like a suite of options. And what's really ends up being funny is not only do we now have three to five new systems yeah. playing this, but when we look at option number one again, the demystifying, the really analyzing everything in that way, usually they're usually able to play that initial section the way um better they're usually able to play yeah. after that practice uh-huh and because of this what i usually end up thinking like i i think of sheet music more as like a sound recipe <laughs> in the sense of mm-hmm. like oh this is not supposed to be a rest it's not pastry baking it's this right. is yeah some this is a casserole this is a recipe for a casserole you yeah. dump in whatever ingredients you already have <laughs> <laughs> Um, you go in and you fall like it's supposed to give you the basic outline of how this thing is supposed to go what this dish is supposed to taste like and look like but it's your own skills of changing for your your own tastes and your own family's tastes and all those things yeah slowly build your own variation and all that stuff and i'm sure there are folks like i i I'm not an expert in old time, and maybe, maybe it's true that there are people that are just like, I'm only going to do this the way that Tommy Gerald did it. 
but in my experience like oh man people adapt and change all the time i yeah I, yeah I, I have yet to see it but once again i might be i'm i see the world as i see as i see myself and so mm -hmm. i don't see the world as it is i see it as we as i am maybe right I'm yeah you know i've been i've been kind of diving a bit deeper into scottish music because i got to be in scotland last summer and i brought home books and i am like okay i want to you know i want to know more i want to try to learn this right so one of the things i've been doing is like <clears throat> looking at the tune books to see how it's written down looking at the session.org which is also a great resource for looking up celtic tunes uh american tunes too for that matter i found a bunch of john reichman's tunes transcribed on the session.org as well <laughs> so they it's got a lot of if it's a tune and doesn't have words then it probably exists somewhere on the session.org so um i i'll go and look and there'll be you know six variations and some of it is that it's played in different keys in different settings um but sometimes there'll be little turns of phrase that are different and sometimes there's even like extra parts that are represented in some of the transcriptions but not others and then because youtube is amazing and you can find so much now i'll go listen to a bunch of different versions and i find that overall there is less melodic variation in scottish music but the exact place that the embellishments go and the kind of embellishment that's put in and certainly the chords which are all the time constantly changing um but even some of the rhythmic things like i i'm kind of baffled by stress space and so i'm trying to learn more about stress space and do some research about them and they have both dotted eighth 16th note and 16th note dotted eighth pairs so you yeah. get the like long short but also short long short long and they mix them up and yeah. so i'm listening to different people play the strath space and most of the time they do the same series of dots but every so often there's a spot where because i'm like listening so intently to try to understand this musical form I realize, well, they did long short and they did short long. And which is it, right? The question is, which is it? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Even in styles that tend to be less improvised melodically, there are still all these moments or people don't play it the same. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. And it's one of those things of like, in a way of what's that old physics kind of idea of once something is observed, it is of changed. It's like, mm -hmm. it's kind of like Schrodinger's cat kind of thing. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right, there isn't a way to observe a thing without then affected. having it affected yeah mm -hmm. and i and so that's one of the things that i want to like i try to bridge the gap with a lot with my students and i think it sounds mm -hmm. like you do too just like oh i'm trying to be as accurate as i can to really understand the strathspeys and all those things I think the biggest thing is, at least for me, being upfront about about mm -hmm. what lens that I'm looking through. Right. And right. That hey, I um, I have students that are really getting into Irish music, and it, at least culturally at this point, now more fully entwined in that culture more than I am. They're going to sessions mm -hmm. two or three times a week and so mm -hmm. now i'm like hey like i can help you with the sounds of of the mechanics of this but you're gonna have to start trusting yourself a little bit more on the right the right and how this works and all that stuff and mm -hmm. it will change from session to session and place to place mm -hmm. and so yeah 
it's it kind of yeah it's really i think learning how music is while it does have things to study and it can feel kind of math and scientific and all these things it really is a expression of art far more mm -hmm. and it's a human things creating human beings creating human things and um and creating more... from the backgrounds and the influences yeah that we've each had coming into it you know when a when a new band is formed and they they're like oh you know this band is doing this thing that's so unique and fun and different or exciting whatever but one of my favorite things to to go through and read is like the individual bios of the people in the band and it'll be like yeah so this guy comes from having played in a punk rock band and then this guy studied jazz and this guy was like a classical pianist who also went to bluegrass festivals and th and then they come together and there's this sort of magical melding of all of their influences that brings out this thing that is new or different sounding and it's because you have all those different lenses that you get to layer together and I don't know to me like that is super exciting and interesting and I think well I'm you know my I'm never going to be the same player that I was before I went to Scotland I'm never going to be the same player I was before I studied classical piano in college like I'm all I'm always becoming a new musician by studying another thing and that, I mean, I guess I just, that to me is really exciting. Like I'm never going to be the same person. I'm always becoming a new person because I'm learning new things about the world and myself and my community. And I'm never going to be the same musician because I'm learning new things about different musical styles and how they fit together. And I love so that. I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I feel like that's kind of the way to go with it because I I don't know I I definitely grew up in a culture that really um idolized the idea of specialization of just like becoming mm -hmm. so good at at something and like really being consumed almost to the point of health detriment by the <laughs> <laughs> and I think there might be some people who resonate with that. <laughs> and... <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, like, I am grateful for the skill sets that I've built and all those yeah. things, but I also think that, man, I there was a lot of time where I closed myself off to opportunities if what was presented was opposed to that specialization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, man, I didn't properly get to appreciate the access I had to that old, mm -hmm. like to that, um, there was a, a guy that would go to gospel grasses that played an old Russian, like, mandolin like the triangle yeah mandolin and i never really appreciated the like having access to someone who was actually fluent in that and i could have learned uh -huh. that and uh -huh. and i don't know i am falling more in love with the parts of my brain that are that jack of all trades that comprehensive knowledge base mm -hmm. a little bit more um I wrote a little poem about it a while back because I'm that kind of nerd on the end, sorry. But it's not like <laughs> a poem, but just like a thought of like, I used to be so mad at myself if I picked up this new hobby and then I just dropped it, you know? Uh -huh. But then I started to realize, like, well, I, I return to them a lot. Like, and it's more of like, oh, when it's like I have a friend that comes into town when these uh, obsessions come back in, the version of myself that's really into cooking comes back in and I get to dust off all the cookbooks that I bought last time and get <laughs> to mm -hmm. know all mm -hmm. my grocery store clerks by a first name basis during that time and 
And then that version of me goes on their merry way and goes on to something else. They leave town and I'm back to, you know, putting together bachelor meals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not microwavable ones. I've moved up from that at least. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's illustrating and sometimes it's recording. And I, I'm so much happier getting to embrace that. Trust okay. that I will learn I might not become the best version of the player that I could have been, but I'll at least be my favorite version of the player that I can be. And Aww. That, yeah. Maybe that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Aww. What? I I don't know. I just think it's so sweet, the idea of, like, I'm my favorite musician. <laughs> and not in, like, an ego way, but in a, like, I listen to all of these other great musicians, and I love them. And then my most favorite sound is whatever sound I can make. Just filling, like, filling all of the corners of my brain with the little things that I like. And, you know, maybe I don't need to go through, maybe we don't need to go through all of the Kreutzer etudes or things, violinists. <laughs> maybe we can just pick the ones that we want or we, do, like, create our own exercise or the cool. one that helps you get to where you want to be next yeah like you don't have to do them in order maybe maybe you do the yeah. one that's like right on the edge of what you can do today just yeah i yeah i think it would have been and so i think that is a goal um that if i could go like i want to have with my own students and if i could ever go back to college or influence college things of just like hey we have tried for the last hundred years to develop a system in which the musicians are at service of like what the institution deems like this is necessary for them. Mm -hmm. And we have come, we're quickly coming to the conclusion that that didn't work out as well as we would like. There are far, <laughs> far more many people who are not playing versus the ones that are. And so how about we switch it? How about mm -hmm. we start to be in service of what students actually want to learn and develop systems that are, I don't know, just in the mm -hmm. face of specialization, in the sense of compre comprehensive uh, things and learning. Uh, and, community yeah. music making. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mm -hmm. I hope there was a sense of narrative for this here today, folks. It was, it was fun to chat about. It was. It was. I always love just um, digging in and getting different perspectives. And yeah, I learn a thing every time we talk. So Aww, hopefully other yeah. people do too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for making a podcast with me, Fran. Thank you. We'll be back probably next week. I hope so. I think so. <laughs> That's our plan anyway. <laughs> But thank you for listening to the Folk Music Educator Podcast. You can find us on Instagram. We post there occasionally, yearly, typically. Uh, you can also <laughs> find us on um, Aaron May Music, right? Yeah. Yep. Aaron and May Music. And Phil and Phil. We're both on Instagram and on and link in bios, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, friends. Fantastic. See y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.